Alright, okay, all right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, the, uh, I was sitting here thinking, I think the, um, the Welsh Agile gods must really, really or God, uh, must really, really hate me. Um, because both days I've gotten the after lunch slot. Um, so now, you know, you guys are going to be falling asleep on me or, or a little bit. So we'll, I'll, I'll do my best not to, um, not to let that happen. I said, I said Welsh, although he's, he's with the, 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 the Agile Welsh God is really Scottish, though. Right? <laughs> um, I, I, I was just thinking, just to come to you, it's it's the Fourth of July today, so um, any, yeah, any, 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 yeah. <laughs> any, any other Americans in the room? I feel like I feel like we should we should be celebrating. Or something. Um, okay, how many people were in my talk yesterday? Oh, well, for those of you who weren't, shame on you. <laughs> um, but I'm glad I'm glad you're here today. You guys remember where we left off yesterday? What we were talking about? Those of you who were here yesterday. What was the what was the last thing I said we were going to talk about today? Anybody remember? Yes. Um, it works. There we go. What does a 19th century Yorkshire cotton industrialist have to do with the Manhattan Project? Anybody look that up? Anybody know the reference? Come on, you guys went home and thought nothing about nothing else than uh, than agile metrics and forecasting and things like that. No, nobody really. No, what's that? The gable. Oh, there was a gable. <laughs> was that what that was? <laughs> yeah. Viva uh -huh. um, There's a, by the way. Oh, whoa, whoa. There's there's some vicious rumor going around too that I was actually supporting Columbia last night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I do have to say it is actually true, so I <laughs> apologize for that. Good result for England, yay, go, go England. Although we're in Wales, right? So yeah. that should be, yeah. <laughs> anyway, whatever. We, we, won't go there. we won't go there. We actually are going to, believe it or not, so yesterday Nadal was playing in Wimbledon, um, and I managed to sneak a little bit of Wimbledon, Wimbledon stuff in there. We actually are going to talk about football just a little bit today um, as, as well. But I really want to talk about what does the 19th century Yorkshire cotton industrials have to do with the Manhattan Project. And to do that, the very first thing that we need to do, or the very first thing I need to offer you, is uh, I want to make a deal. Let's make a deal. Has anyone heard of the American game show called Let's Make a Deal? Yes. Anyone heard of that? Yes? Anyone? I'm hoping most people haven't. No. no most people haven't? Okay, good. Yeah. No. Oh, by the way, I probably should have mentioned, um, for those of you who weren't here last time, as you can imagine, I like to keep these, these talks very informal, very interactive. I am going to be asking a lot of questions, so just feel free to shout those the, the answers out, and I will, I will land on you like a sumo wrestler if you're wrong. So, <laughs> uh, so let's, let's make a deal. Um, there's, there's a, it, it's, it's a very, very, it's maybe the worst known secret in America, but very little known outside of America, that the best game shows in America are actually run by Canadians. Um, so Let's Make a Deal is run by this guy, or was created by this guy called Monty Hall. He kind of looks Canadian, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so Monty Hall created this game show called, uh, called Let's Make a Deal. And if you ever, if you wa ever watch Let's Make a Deal, because they've rebooted it, they've got a new host now and um, they started it. If you're ever in America, you catch Let's Make a Deal. Um, and you look at the audience, the audience looks something like this. Right? These people show up in these really kind of outrageous costumes because the purpose, of, the way the game show works is, is Monty Hall, or now the guy's name is Wayne Brady, but Monty Hall would, would walk the audience and he would randomly select people from the audience to play various games throughout the game show, right? And so that's why these people dress up in really, really crazy costumes um, because they want to catch Monty Hall's eye and they want to play these, they want to play these games. One of the games that they play, um, he'll, select, uh, uh, um, he'll select one of the people from the audience and what he'll do is he'll show the audience, uh, the, the contestant, the stage. And on the stage is three closed doors. Okay? Now some of you may have heard this example before. If you have heard this example before, please don't shout out the answer. Um, so I'm hoping most of you have, have not heard this. You okay? Need some water? I got some water. Um, he'll show the contestant three closed doors. Um, behind one of the closed doors is a brand new car. Behind, the, behind each of the other two closed doors um, is a goat. And the object of the game is very, very, very simple. If you select the door that has the brand new car, you win the brand new car. It's very, very easy. So what do you guys want to do? You, want to, you guys want to play Let's Make a Deal? 
Yeah. Let's play this make a deal. There's there's a couple reasons why I love showing this this particular example is because um, fundamentally what Monty Hall is doing is he's asking us to make a forecast. Right? He's asking us to you tell me which one of those doors has the car. He's asking us to make a prediction. He's asking us to make a forecast. Now those of you who said stay, what was your thinking in terms of why you said stay? Just because everybody else was saying it. <laughs> so if you were you, if you were the only only contestant on the show, and you were given this opportunity to stay, why would you stay? Just what were you thinking? What were some of the things that went through your head? Just it's it's okay. The, the, yeah, sure. the extra information doesn't do anything to change my mind. The extra information doesn't do anything well, to no, change the, my mind. The extra information gives more certainty. Yeah. Gives more certainty. There was uncertainty before, and now we have some certainty. Yeah. Was anybody thinking about like so? Change the position. Yeah. What was our what was our what was our chances of winning before he revealed the door number? Sorry, before he revealed door number one. One in three. One in three. So I mean, were some of you guys thinking too? You know, hey, you know, we have a thirty-three percent chance, and the fact that he just revealed door number one, we still kind of have a thirty-three percent chance. So I mean, a couple of things here. We're talking about uncertainty. We're talking about probability. Um, when we're when we're talking about predicting the future, when we're talking about forecasting, that's kind of the way we have to think. You know, what are our possible future outcomes? And what are our chances of getting each one of those outcomes? We're going to be talking a lot about um, a lot about that today. That's kind of the fundamental part of, uh, of forecasting. Go back to back to um, this. Uh, it's a bit cliched, but I mean, every day, and this this week has been kind of typical of it. Every day there are forecasts that you guys come across um, that you see every single day. What's looks like? What's, what's one of the most common things what? that you? Yeah, weather forecast. Right? We see weather forecasting every single day. We hear about weather forecasting every single day. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but I actually live in South Florida right now, um, just outside of Miami, between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. I don't know if anyone's been to Florida um, or not. Um, but I just moved, I, I shouldn't say I just moved there. I've been there for about three years. And as you can imagine, once I moved to South Florida, I, um, I got very, very interested in hurricanes. Right? By the way, I'm gonna say hurricanes, not hur hurricane, hurricanes. Is that how you guys said hurricanes? Um, hurricanes. I got very, very interested in hurricanes. Why did I get very, very interested in hurricanes? Because you guys probably know this. Uh, in the North Atlantic here, in this area right here between the, uh, the equator and the Tropic of uh, Tropic of Cancer, is the one that's north? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I see. I'm American. I know geography. Um, <laughs> the Tropic of Cancer, um, especially between, say, June 1st, like this time of year, June 1st and December 1st, there's a lot of storms that develop here. And those storms that develop will usually track to the west and to the north according to the prevailing winds in that part of the world. Right? Now, if you, where do you think, if you live somewhere and there are storms here that track to the west and north, where do you think that you would, might want to be nervous about these storms? That you are right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the eastern side of, uh, of the US, because these storms usually track and hit. So you can imagine that the United States has a very, very vested interest in understanding <coughs> when these storms form, if they're going to track and if they're going to hit the US. And speaking of which, yeah, I live right there. Right? So, which is, you know, right in that, in that zone of danger. So I become very, 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 very interested in, um, in hurricane forecasting. And it turns out that, turns out these guys actually know a little bit about forecasting. Believe it or not, they know, they know quite a bit about forecasting, much more than, than we do. Um, and the question is, are there some things that they know that we don't, that we can incorporate into, uh, um, into that. So I, I lived through my first, it was kind of a hurricane. I mean, it kind of just kind of grazed up the side of Florida. But last year, um, there was a hurricane. I think this one was Irma. There were a couple of hit. There were a couple of, anyway, this is a picture of, of my backyard um, in, that, in that first hurricane. This is about the worst of the damage that we got, just a down tree and a, and a down fence and, and things like that. But you can imagine how, I mean, that could have been much, much, much worse um, and how, how advantageous a, um, a forecast might have been, an accurate forecast might have been. Now, I don't want to talk about last year. I want to go back to October 22nd, 2012. Um, there was, a, hurric there was a, a storm that formed in the Southern Caribbean. Right? Um, and this particular storm, once it formed, we have in the United States, we have an agency called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I think. But specifically within NOAA, there's a, a, um, an agency called the National Hurricane Center. 
And when one of these storms form, they put out one of these forecasts. Has anyone seen a picture like this before? Yes. Um, you can see that this storm, this is Monday, October 22nd, 2012. Um, you guys know how we name our storms. This, was, this storm was so new, and it wasn't really even all that big, um, that they just called it Tropical Depression 18. They didn't even have a name yet, right? okay? So they put out this forecast, it's just called Tropical Depression 18. Tropical Depression, by the way, is just a fancy name for thunderstorm, really. Um, they put out this, um, but, here we are, um, that particular storm grew to become the largest hurricane ever recorded by diameter, as measured by diameter. Does, uh, does anybody know the name of this one? This is, so this is an interesting psychological experiment because I didn't mean I didn't mean for this when I put this in, but whenever I ask people for the name of this hurricane, almost everybody guesses Katrina, and I it must have been how the the news was reported on Katrina because this storm is actually much 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 bigger than Katrina, but be, because of I don't know a whole whole bunch of things that were going on at the time, maybe it didn't get as much play. Does anybody know? It wasn't so it wasn't Katrina. Sandy. Yeah, it was Hurricane Sandy. Right. In fact, it was so big. They even, they didn't name it Hurricane Sandy, they named it Superstorm Sandy, right? This, it, was, it, was, it was so big. So Hurricane Sandy, as I just mentioned, was the largest hurricane in the North Atlantic ever, as recorded by diameter, as measured by diameter. It was the second costliest in US history, I think Katrina was first there. Um, and it affected 24 states, and you know, parts of Canada, we really care about Canada, um, but 24 states, with uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York suffering the most damage. Right? Usually these hurricanes hit, they affect two or three states, maybe. This affected 24 states and Canada. Um, and uh, uh, so would you, have, would you have guessed any of that just by looking at this picture here? I'm hoping your answer is no. I wouldn't have, right? Um, so the question is, oh, sorry, there's one other thing. One of the most important thing about, um, about Sandy, this is kind of the most important thing, and this is probably why there wasn't much news about it, is there was surprisingly little loss of life. Now, obviously, any loss of life is tragic, right? But I think all the deaths are attributed to Sandy. I think there were, I think there were 11. Um, the biggest hurricane ever, and there were only, um, only 11 deaths. So that tells us that the, the National Hurricane Center probably knows a little something that we don't in terms of forecasting and giving people enough time uh, to, do, to do something about it. So let's investigate some of the stuff that they know that we don't, okay? What's going on in this picture? What's, what's the first thing that kind of jumps out at you when you see this picture? It's just yeah, the cone of uncertainty. Yeah, there's, there's, there's this white thing here, this white cone, um, and unlike the traditional cone of uncertainty, what happens to this cone over time? It widens. It actually widens. Um, does anybody know, so we're, we're talking about the cone. Does anybody know specifically what does this cone signify? Potential trajectory. Where, so where it will go, where what will go? Yeah, yeah the center. It's actually projecting the center of the storm. Um, so you, you guys probably didn't see this. I, mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe your eyesight is that good. But up here, in this black box at the top of the screen, they actually um, explain to us what's going on in this cone. So I'm gonna blow it up there so you guys can see it. Right? Um, and what, what, what that cone represents is it contains the probable path of the storm center, but does not show the size of the storm. So you guys know these storms are pretty big. So there can be damage, extensive damage, outside of even what they're showing in this, in this cone. Okay, but notice that's my emphasis right there, by the way, on probable, that's my emphasis. When they say probable, what do you think they mean when they say probable? Guessing. Like they're guessing, yeah, they're absolutely, yeah, definitely, definitely <laughs> guessing. It's the muddled, the muddled, it's muddled. Previous. Yeah, but if we're talking about, exactly, based on previous data, based on the models, um, but if we're talking about certainty and uncertainty, what do you think probable is? Is probable 50%? Is probable 75%? Is probable 100%? Well, we don't know. More than 50? More than 50? Anyone else? It's, it's, a, it's a gradient. The probability gradient is, is, is it's, you know, 80% down the bottom end. And Actually, I'm going to tell you that this cone, this whole cone, represents the same probability. Anywhere uh -huh. in this storm is the same probability. So, so it's a good guess, yeah. um, but it's, it's, it's not actually a gradient. It's, it's showing, there's, there's, they have a, a specific um, 
percentage range, let's say, uh, associated with this. So we've got you know more than 50. Do you think they're any certain than more than 50? 90. I mean, we would hope, if this is weather forecasting, or this is hurricanes, we're talking about life and death, we would hope they'd be pretty certain, right? Um, it turns out you can go, I'm a geek, I'm a nerd, I read about this stuff, right? Um, you can go and read the documentation behind <coughs> this, and that cone represents the 60 to 70% chance that the center, just the center, will <coughs> go through that. So, I mean, all of these, so the, the, the center can track all the way up there, can track all the way up there, and any point in between. There are multiple, multiple possible outcomes that this center could track. And we're saying of all those possible outcomes, we have roughly a 60 to 70% chance that it's going to track somewhere in there. Why not 100%? Why can't they give me 100%? These guys, these guys are supposed to be good at this stuff, right? Why can't I have a cone that's 100%? Too many variables. Too many variables. What are some of the variables that are in there? We, wind, 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 wind direction, wind speed, can change. Change. The humidity, uh, water temperature, yeah. other point. storms in the area, right? All of these variables. If I wanted 100%, what do you think that cone would look like? It'd be Earth, essentially, right? <laughs> if, I wanted, if I wanted 100%, it would essentially be Earth, which is, which is really no information whatsoever, right? This is why they don't say 100%. So just like in our Monty Hall example, when we're talking about forecasting, there's no such thing as 100%. There's no such thing as deterministic thinking. It's not deterministic. Weather forecasting is uncertain. And whenever we're talking about predicting the future, when there's uncertainty, you have to take a probabilistic approach. You have to. You can't take a deterministic approach because we don't know. Right? The problem is, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's James, right? James. I don't know if anyone did when James talks. James talk. Um, the problem when think, thinking probabilistically is humans are actually very, very, very bad at thinking probabilistically. Our intuition usually lets us down when we start thinking probabilistically. In fact, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure what it means to think probabilistically. I'm going to give you a kind of my, my thoughts on what that means here in a second. But we're just not trained to do it, and we can't really rely on our intuition, which means we're going to need to bring some other tools into play um, because we're, we're, we're usually going to think about it incorrectly. Thinking probabilistically, this is my definition, but thinking probabilistically means acknowledging that there is more than one possible future outcome. Right? We don't know the future, just like those three doors on the stage. Right? There's three possible outcomes in the Monty Hall. In the hurricane, there's literally probably millions, if not billions, of possible outcomes that can, that can happen. Right? We don't know exactly which one. What the National Hurricane Center then tries to do is try to model as much as they can. They try to model those possible outcomes. This is one such uh, model of, of Sandy's projected path. This black line, by the way, is, is what the path it actually took. Right? Maybe you guys have seen this, too. You know, sometimes they refer to it as spaghetti plots. Um, but maybe you guys have seen this stuff. And that's what they're trying to do, is they're trying to model all these possible outcomes. And they'll draw that cone based on those models. Has anyone seen something like this before? Hopefully. Yeah. This is, this is exactly what they're doing behind the, line, uh, behind the scenes. By the way, um, last year, this is kind of one of my favorite things to ask. Last year, so there's a whole bunch of models. So like uh, the National Hurricane Center has a model. Um, I think Europe somewhere has a model. Does anybody know what the, for last year anyway, what the most accurate model of hurricane predicting was for the US? There's a reason I'm asking this because we're in the UK. Yeah, the Met Office. The Met Office has their own model for, uh, for predicting hurricanes. And theirs, was, theirs was by far and away last year, by far and away the most, um, the most accurate. So but anyway, this is, like I said, this is, this are all our possible outcomes, and they're trying to choose what that probabilistic path is based on those, um, on those outcomes. Now, here's the question. Was this the only forecast that the National Hurricane Center made? Did they say, you know what? This storm formed, it's Monday, October 22nd. This form, this storm formed. Here's your forecast. Thank you very much. See you guys. Good luck. <laughs> Goodbye. Is that? Is that what they did? Did they just say, hey, that's the plan, and the you know the plan is the plan, and we gotta stick to the plan, and because that's the plan? Do they do you think they did that? Sure. Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, do you guys know what the National Hurricane Center does? Constantly. Constantly. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. You can say the answer. It's okay. It's okay. Um, they, they, they put out, as they get new information, they are constantly putting out new forecasts. Um, here's the very next day. So this was Monday. Hopefully we can see this. This is Monday. This is now Tuesday, October 23rd. 
Uh, they put out an updated forecast. Um, early on, their, their forecasts are fairly spread apart, like I think every 12 hours. Um, if the storm grows bigger and bigger and it looks like it's threatening the US, they'll shrink that time. They'll go down to eight out, every eight hours, every five hours, every three hours, and then essentially almost continuously, they're putting out forecasts. So this is Tuesday, October 23rd. Um, imagine if this was the only forecast that the National Hurricane Center made. If you remember I said that Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey were the most affected states? If, I can ask you guys this because you guys are good at geography. I have a hard time with this one in America. I don't really know where Pennsylvania is, but you guys all know where Pennsylvania is. Um, if, uh, if you lived in New York, Pennsylvania, or New Jersey, and you saw this forecast, what are you thinking right now? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's curving out into the Atlantic. You know, um, I live somewhere over here, so I'm good. Everything's good, right? Um, one week later, that's what Sandy looked like. That was a storm. Can't even see Pennsylvania, New York, or New Jersey, can you? Yeah. Pretty, 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 pretty crazy. Um, this, by the way, um, so like I said, the, the National Hurricane Center forecasts, their uh, updates are forecasts constantly as they get new information. This is, this is probably my, this next one is probably my favorite slide um, in the whole deck. It's, it's going to show you a time lapse of all of the, um, of all the forecasts that, that the NHC made. Uh, so you can see how, um, to me it's pretty fascinating because you can see how it looks like it's gonna curve out and then it takes a sharp left turn right in and makes a direct hit on, uh, on uh, New York and, and, and Pennsylvania. Um, so, but you can see how they're, they're constantly, constantly updating, um, you know, up updating their, uh, uh, their forecast. So what else is happening? One more thing. There's so one more thing I want to talk about in this picture. What else is happening in this picture? Speeding up. Speeding up. Yeah. Maybe. With the severity of what's going to hit. Uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm looking change. specifically. What 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 kind of time frame are they giving me here? Three days. Three days. Yeah, well, three. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. This is so. If this is today, one, two, three. They're only projecting out three days, three maybe four days, right? Why can't if if remember I showed you that that the picture of what Sandy looked like a week later? Why can't they give me a forecast out a week or two weeks or 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 thirty days? Three body problem. What's that? Three body dynamic. Yeah. Problem. Again, there's there's way 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 too much too much uncertainty here. Right? Like, what would that cone look like if they had to project out, say, for the next two weeks or the next 30 days, what would that cone look like? Again, Earth. Right? It essentially look like Earth. So what we've covered here um, is some basic principles of forecasting. And I want, you know, we're going to quickly review, and I want you to think in your head as I go through these basic principles of forecasting, is this stuff that you guys do right now when you're asked for an estimate, when you're asked for a forecast, are these some of the things that you incorporate in your forecast? Number one, do you think probabilistically and not deterministically? Do you communicate your forecast in terms of a range of, a, of a range of possible outcomes and a probability associated with those outcomes? Does anybody do that now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Probably, maybe yes, maybe no, but I mean, if you're, if you're enlightened, you do. Um, now, do you update those forecasts as you get information? This is not unlike Hurricanes, our projects are not unlike hurricanes in that every day we're getting more and more information about how our project is going. You guys update your forecast based on that, on that information. Yes. yes, maybe no. Yes. We update it in a probabilistic way, maybe. Um, and then, of course, do we favor shorter term forecasts rather than longer term ones? You know, do you get asked to put together a three year forecast um, that you know will be invalid in the next three weeks? Right? We're going to be talking a lot about, about these. Um, so the question now becomes, I'm hoping the question you're going to ask yourselves, is how do we apply this? It's great for, for hurricane forecasting, but how do we apply this for our context, right? So number one, think probabilistically and not deterministically. Um, what do we need to think probabilistically about? When I say think probabilistically and not deterministically, what essentially are we thinking probabilistically about? Those of you who were in my, my session yesterday, you should know the answer to this. What's that question we're going to get asked? On our project, we make it. Yeah, will it be done? Right. Um, and when we say when, will it so um, as I mentioned before, the answer to this question requires a probabilistic answer. Thinking probabilistically means acknowledging there's more than one possible answer. 
As a real world example, let's just say that I've started a project and I've completed 12 stories in one week. I have 120 stories left in my backlog. When will that project be finished? Traditionally, how would we answer this question? We look at the velocity and project it forward. Yeah. And if you're traditional project management, how would you answer this oh, question? Oh, sorry, you can't. <laughs> Next week. Next <laughs> week. <laughs> but realistically, how would, I mean, what, how would you guys answer this question? Ten weeks. Ten weeks. Ten weeks. Ten weeks. say, hey, we're getting 12 stories. Uh, no, notice I made the math pretty easy. Oh, sorry, the math's pretty easy. Um, you know, we've, we're, we're, we're doing 12 stories a week. We've got 120 stories left. 120 divided by 12 is 10 weeks. We'll be done in 12 weeks. What's, what's the problem with that answer? We there are at least two problems with that answer. They're all different size stories. Um, <laughs> probably even more fundamental than that. Because honestly, the size, I don't know. I am definitely, I am definitely not getting invited back to this yeah. conference. I just know that for sure. But if if I were invited back, sorry, just one second. If I were invited back, the very next talk that I want to do, um, it's one of my favorite talks to do. Um, it's called "Why Size Doesn't Matter." Um, interestingly enough, I get a lot of guys that show up for that. Uh, but it talks about how what what a poor predictor of of duration, what a poor predictor of elapsed time. Like things like relative complexity and, and uh, t-shirt sizing and all this stuff. Very, very, very poor predictors of, um, uh, of elapsed time. So it's not necessarily that the stories are different size. That's not what's fatal. It's important, but it's not what's fatal. What's the problem? If you're a customer and you're here, you hear 10 weeks, what are you thinking? Change. Well, change. What's that? 120 stories is probably not your whole product. It's, you've probably not captured all the scope. So in 10 weeks, you will finish what? To potentially finish the work in the backlog. Yeah, so you're, you're, thinking, the you're thinking sanely there. <laughs> I'm a customer and I hear 10 weeks. Yeah. Me as a customer, what am I thinking? I'm thinking 10 weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking 100%. You guys said 10 weeks. That's with 100% certainty. I'm going to get 10 weeks. Right? What's the, what's, that's number one. What's the second problem with that answer? 10 weeks. Those of you who were in yesterday, remember I gave you some homework yesterday in my, in my talk? Do you guys remember? I asked you to read a book. <laughs> Nobody read that book overnight? <laughs> Nobody read the book overnight? <laughs> Seriously? You guys are supposed to be good at this. <laughs> it's called uh, The Flaw of Averages. That 10 weeks is an average forecast. And remember, what did I say the flaw of averages is? Or the basic premise of the flaw of averages? Average doesn't deal with uncertainty. So that's number one. An average doesn't communicate uncertainty. If I say 10 weeks, there's no communication of uncertainty there. I don't know. If, I, if I'm a customer and I heard 10 weeks, I'm thinking 100%. But as well, the flaw of averages is plans based on average fail on average. Right? That's the premise of the, of, of the flaw of averages. That's why it's so important. There's, there's a reason that I, I'm not just giving you guys stuff to read to read. Right? There's, you know, there's a reason. Um, OK, so when we think about this, we think about the hurricane. This, remember I said, that was the very first thing that we talked about was this cone. This was the range. This cone represented the range of possible outcomes, and then the 60 to 70 percent was the probability associated with it. So when you communicate a forecast, it should have at least, at least, it might have more than this, but it should have at least, sorry, two things, sorry. <laughs> um, it should have at least two things, um, a range and a probability, a range of possible outcomes and a probability associated with that range, right? Uh, okay. So now, if, if I'm telling you that all forecasts should have a range and a probability, what is the very next question you want to ask? How do I come up with that range? Unfortunately, that's not the right, act, right, right, act, or not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is, what does 19th century Yorkshire cotton <laughs> industry have to do with the Manhattan Project? Anybody? Tailoring? Tailorism? Oh, Taylorism. No, 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 not Taylorism. Anyone really? No? No? Anyone heard of Monte Carlo? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to talk about a little thing. Uh, there's something, a little probabilistic tool called uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Don't, it's actually very, 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 very easy. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to show you maybe in five minutes how to do it, kind of. Um, but the answer, yeah, the answer is, so does anyone know the, the connection between the Yorkshire kind of industrialist and the uh, Manhattan Project? No? 
So this supposedly, it's, it's kind of lore, I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, I've read several stories on this, but apparently there was some Yorkshire cotton industrialist that was the first person to break the bank at the Monte Carlo Casino. casino. Um, and the Manhattan Project was the first um, known implementation of something called Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and the reason that they called it Monte Carlo simulation is because one of the scientists' uncle loved to gamble at the, uh, the Monte Carlo uh, casino. So <coughs> a little bit of trivia for you. Um, OK, so what we're going to talk about is from Monte Hall to Monte Carlo. Um, that 12 stories, yeah, very good. That 12 stories per week, <coughs> let's, do, let's do this. You'd think I'd be ready with all this stuff, right? Let's do this. Um, and actually, let's do that. Okay. That, um, ah, sorry. that when, when I said we're doing 12 stories per week, does anybody know what is that a measure of? Throughput. Throughput. It's a, it's a flow metric called throughput. It's potentially different from velocity. It doesn't have to be different from velocity, but it's potentially different from velocity. But throughput is literally a count a count of the number of items that get done per unit of time. We're going to call that throughput. So this chart right here represents, for example, a team's historical throughput um, for each given day. So across the bottom is a timeline, and I think I do have it in UK dates, I believe, that this is, uh, yeah, this is May 1st and it's not January 5th, right? So this is UK dates. Um, so for example, this particular team got 12 items completed on April 20th, you can see they got seven items completed on April 16th. They got zero items completed. You see there's a whole bunch of, hopefully you guys can see this, there's a whole bunch of zeros down here. They got zero items completed on April 3rd. What we can do is we can take all of this historical throughput and we can feed it into something called a Monte Carlo simulation. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into the details of how that works. But what I can do is, um, you know, run this over and over and over again, which kind of takes me to back to the Monty Hall stuff. Um, anybody want to change your answer, by the way? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, what is one way that I could figure out, if I really don't know what the best strategy <coughs> is here, what's one way I could figure it out? Yes. Guess. Absolutely, you could guess. What's maybe a more empirical way that I could go? <laughs> yeah, just run it over and over and over again. Let's play this game over and over and over again, and let's track the results, right? That's one way that we could figure it out. So you guys, we picked door number three, is that right? So we're gonna play, we're gonna pick door number three again. That's essentially what this website is running, is a Monte, uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So we're gonna pick door number three again, and unfortunately we lose. Um, and we don't we don't have we don't have a ton of data here, but you roughly have a, if you switch you roughly have a sixty six percent chance of winning, and if you don't switch you roughly have a thirty three percent chance of winning. So your odds of winning are actually twice as big if you switch. Right? It turns out that that extra information is of crucial importance to us, and we need to incorporate that into our forecast. But the way that we would know this, I mean, if there was no way to figure out this mathematically, or it was impossible or really difficult to figure out, the way that we would do it is we would run it over and over and over again, and we track the results, because again, our intuition told us, you know what, we should stick with our gut. Our gut told us door number three, Monte Hall is just trying to trick us, so let's stick with door number three. But if you look at the, if you look at the probability behind it, um, we should actually switch. And it's going to be the same thing with our projects. So if we take this historical throughput, any questions about that, by the way? I guess I, I should be asking for questions. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? We can take the same approach with our historical throughput. We can, sorry. What's the rationale for the switching to drive an increased Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask that. Statistically, it should. Yeah, ah, look at this. If I, if I draw on a whiteboard, is that going to? Is that going to screw you up? Or? No, no, that's going to be good. How much time do I have, by the way? I know we did kind of start late. Anybody know? Do I have like 10, 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. Only 15? Only 15? Right, we got to make this quick. Uh, there's that. I just brought this out, and I didn't even check to see if there are any markers. Are there any markers? Can I borrow one of yours? <laughs> 
Thank you. You're not doing anything important anyway, right? <laughs> All right. This is going to be an unsatisfactory answer break. Can everybody see this, by the way? Yeah. It's going to be very, very unsatisfactory, but I'm going to show you anyway. Um, so we have three doors, three closed doors. Um, when I'm first when I'm first selecting, when all the doors are closed, what are my chances of being right for any? 33% for all of them, right? 33%, that is 33%, by the way. 33%, 33%. I'm really glad you guys chose door number three, by the way. So when we choose door number three, that means we have a 33% chance of it being door number three, and we have a 66% chance of it not being door number three, either door number one or door number two. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. So it's either this or it's not this. So this becomes 66%. When we picked door number three, Monty Hall actually showed us door number one. So we know it's not door number one. That means it has to be a 66% chance that it's door number two. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> I knew it would be. I knew it would be. Yeah, I know. It's, it's yeah. I do. That's yeah, that's all I'm going to say on it. Tom, you guys have to. Right. Right now, all you guys are going to be talking about is why uh, why the Monty Hall problem doesn't work. All right. But well, let's get back. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, the thing is, we need to take a similar. Oh, sorry, question. <laughs> okay. I believe three card Monty came first. I believe, but I don't. I don't. Honestly, I don't know for sure. I, I really don't know. But I don't know. Um, uh, okay. So we're going to kind of do the same thing. We're going to take our historical throughput, and we're going to, using this historical throughput, we're going to simulate what our project might look like in the future, and we're going to do it over and over and over and over and over again to try and get an understanding of what our probability is associated with certain outcomes. Um, that's, a, that's really all we're doing. Um, think of it this way. Uh, when I flip a coin, what are my chances of, of getting heads? 50%. Fifty percent. How do I know it's fifty percent? So there's two sides of a coin, and you know, so it's one divided by two is you know 0. 0.5. What if I'm really, 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 really bad at math? Because I'm you know I'm American. So what if I'm really, really bad at, at math and I can't divide one divided by two? What's one way? One into two. What's 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 one way? What's another way that I could I could figure this out? Flip it over and over and over and over and over again, and just track the results, right? Um, of course, that's going to involve some math too, but never mind that. <laughs> um, so it's it's the same thing with our project, right? Um, somebody tell me my laptop. I'm just uh, We can use that historical throughput, and we can run it over and over and over and over and over again, and we can come up with what it looks like um, for when this project will complete. So in this particular example, I'm saying assuming that it's hard, I know it's kind of hard to say, but assuming that our project start our our simulation starts today, July 4th, Happy Independence Day, um, and we have 100 items in our backlog, how long is it going to take to complete? Well, we run that, oops, I don't want to do that, I want to do that. We run our simulation over and over and over again, and what we get is this. We get a probability distribution of all the possible outcomes. So uh, along the bottom here are all the dates associated with all those possible outcomes. What this is telling us is we have a 50% chance it's kind of hard to see, but we have a 50% chance of being finished on or before August 8th. We have an 85% chance of being finished on or before August 16th. Right? So again, we're thinking probabilistically, we need to know what is what are the range of possible outcomes and the probability associated with each. This results histogram gives us that. Now, if you were to show this to your customers, your customer's eyes would just glaze over and they'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. So we need to put this in a little bit more um, digestible form, which is, you know, they're used to looking at calendars. And we can, we can kind of take the same approach that they do in hurricane forecasting. And uh, we can use colors to show the, the probability of different outcomes. 
So anything here in the dark green has a greater than 95% um, probability of it finishing. Um, anything here in the, in the red is less than 50%. So our customer can come and say, you know, we absolutely have to have those 100 things by August 1st. We can say, well, you know, there's a chance of that happening, but there's only a 12 to 16% chance of that happening. Is that a bet you're really willing to make? Um, and you can see how hopefully that's going to change the conversation a little bit to try and figure out what is, what are odds that they're really um, more interested in. And now it's basic project management stuff. We can cut scope, we can change the date, we can you know, add people, God forbid add people, we can God forbid, even more God forbid, work overtime. Um, we can even more God forbid add people and work overtime. Feel free to tell me if this is that. Uh... Uh, me just trying to work out okay. what's going on here. But so if I understand it right, you've got the throughput tracked here, mm -hmm. and the Monte Carlo simulation. Does that take essentially each of those possible throughputs and say, okay, well, if the throughput was five continuously every day for the rest of the project, then we'd end up here. If it was twenty-five, whatever the maximum was, then we end up here. Is that still assuming that? Does that take into account the variance of throughput yes. during that time as well? Because obviously. Yeah. The throughput here, you can see that one day it's zero, another day it's 25. Yeah, so, what, so it's, it's a little bit, um, I don't know if everybody heard that um, answer. I hope they can hear it on the tape. tape. I said tape, I'm dating myself, right? On the video. Black swan. Um, I'm right next to you. Did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's a little bit different than that. So we say, if we say starting today, we're going to randomly choose one of these throughputs. Right? And it could be 12. So we're going to say, okay, today we got 12 stories done. Right? Now tomorrow, so we remember we got 12 stories done. Tomorrow, we're going to randomly choose one of these throughputs. Okay, that's a zero. Right? So we got zero done. So 12 plus zero is still 12. Right? The next day, we're going to randomly choose one of these throughputs. Let's say that's five. Right? So now we have 12, zero, and five. That's 17. We're going to keep doing that until we cross 100. Once we cross that 100, we're going to track the date that we got, how many days it took to get to that. We're going to track that, and then we're going to throw it on our, our histogram. Right? And then we're going to do it again and again and again. In that particular example I showed you, we actually did that 10,000 times. Why 10,000? It's because we can, um, honestly. So does that, does that help a little yeah, bit? Yeah, no, that, that does. Yeah. That's essentially what's going on, and that's how you're coming up with this. Um, but, because we're quickly running out of time. Um, so that should you've got the base data to run against. Yes. That assumes you have the data to run this against. But, but so a couple things. One. Um, chances are you do have this data. A lot of people say, well, what if I don't have any data? Chances are you do have this data. Number two, if you don't have the data, then, and there have been several talks about this, I think, over the past couple of days. If you don't have the data, then go get the data. You know, um, so start running the project and tracking it. If you don't have the data, honestly, pretty much any estimation technique you use will work because they'll all be equally bad. <laughs> um, but the point is to validate whatever that estimation that you made, to validate it very, very quickly with the data that we're getting off, but we can feed it into this Monte Carlo simulation because you really don't need much data to get this Monte Carlo simulation going. In fact, you need a lot, a lot less than you think that you do. So, sorry, I know I'm a little bit under the gun because we started a little bit late. I apologize for that. I hope I'm not going too fast, which I know I, 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 know I am. So you're going to do the same thing for your project. You're going to track two things. Remember yesterday, I told you guys, sorry, I told you guys to track two things. Um, start date and end date from using from just that data we can calculate throughput and we can run a Monte Carlo simulation um, Principle number two updates your forecast as you get more information. Remember this thing. It's the same thing um, It's something that I like to call continuous forecasting. This is a hashtag. I'm trying to get trending to trend on Twitter It's not working. Maybe you guys can help me out um, But it's this idea as, as we get more information we we need to at least evaluate whether it's relevant information and we need to incorporate it into our forecast. Um, has anyone heard of the site 538, Nate Silver, 538, has anyone heard of this site? Nate Silver ran, uh, became prominent, I think because of the 2012, 2012 presidential election. He was one of the few people that, that correctly predicted the, the Obama win. He, I think he, correct, he correctly predicted every single state um, that Obama won and Obama lost. Um, and so he started this, he started this website called 538 that explores all things probabilistic. And one of the things that he, um, I'm, one of the things that he tracks is football. Um, I'm not, and especially the World Cup, <coughs> I'm not going to talk about a particular game last night. I want to go back uh, a couple of nights, and I want to talk about Belgium and Japan. Um, and if you go to the, if you go to the 538 website, 
it's really the words 538.com, you can see he will, he will update probabilities. This is a, this is a probability, um, real-time probability of the chances of each team winning. So you can see at the start of the game, Japan had, um, I don't know, what is that, a 20% chance of winning, and Belgium had an 80% chance of winning. Right? And you can see those probabilities stay roughly the same until right after the second half. Right, so right, after, right at the start of the second half. Anybody remember what happened right at the start of the second half? So Japan scored not only one goal, but two. two goals. They scored two goals. And you can see the probability of Japan winning skyrocketed. Now, can you imagine if we said, you know, our plan is for Belgium to win. Belgium's going to win. Belgium's going to win. And then uh, Japan scores two goals. And we say, oh, you know, don't worry. Now, it turns out that Belgium actually came back and won. But if you were, if you were a betting person, you know, at about the 70th minute, and you were betting on Belgium winning, you know, probably 80 times out of 100, you would have lost that bet if you wouldn't have updated your forecast. So um, we do this similarly at a, at, a, at, a client, oops, uh, at a client that I'm at right now. Um, this is a, a dashboard. You can see there's um, all the teams here and all the releases for all of these teams. It's something that they look at every single day. They run a Monte Carlo pretty much in real time. As, as teams get stories finished, as new stories come in, as dates change or whatever, they're constantly updating this dashboard. Um, and you can see how they show you know, what their completion, their 85% completion date is, their completion likelihood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is continuous forecasting in practice. Every day they get together and they talk about this. And you can see they color coded. There's red, yellow, and green, classic red, yellow, and green stuff. Um, but it's not the colors that are important because the colors they just chose arbitrarily. For example, I think. Um, Red is less than 70, uh, yellow is between 70 and 90, and green is above 90. So the colors themselves are not important. What they really talk about is when something changes colors. Right? If something goes from green to red, why did that happen? And you can see using Monte Carlo simulation, we can get that signal that something's going wrong much, much, much sooner, rather than everything, everything's great. Everything's green, 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 and then the day before the release, oh yeah, by the way, we're not going to make it. Yeah. Uh, that's that. Shorter term forecasts, better and longer ones, we talked about that. Okay, so to sum up, um, that was just principle number three. Yeah, everybody remembers that. That's, hopefully that's common sense. It's honestly, this is, this, is, this is the genius of Scrum, right? As compared to like the waterfall world. Scrum came along and said, why are, we, why are we making plans 18 months out? You know, let's only make them 14 days or at most 30 days out, right? That was, that was, that was a monumental shift in thinking back in the, the mid to late 90s. Right, that's, that's, that's the genius of Scrum. Uh, okay, so to sum up, if you track nothing else, track the, the date that the starts and the date it completes. Uh, we can calculate throughput from that. Um, we can use a Monte Carlo simulation with that historical throughput to get our, our possible outcomes. We can communicate that, those forecasts in terms of range and probability, and you're gonna update your forecast as you get more information, and when you're possible, favor shorter term ones over longer term ones. This doesn't mean that you can't forecast longer term, what that does mean, though, is you can't be upset when that long-term forecast fails or, or changes or changes on you, right? Um, so these are these are all the principles, some basic some basic principles of forecasting. Um, but remember, most importantly, your forecasts you know the best forecasts in the world world don't make any sense unless you actually take action. Two great books on this subject that you guys saw yesterday: When Will It Be Done? Um, and Actual Ma Agile Metrics for Predictability. <laughs> Um, also, too, this is probably a pretty good resource for you. That dashboard I was showing you was taken from um, a case study called Ultimate Kanban. So if you just Google Ultimate Kanban and the case study at um, Ultimate Kanban InfoQ, you should come. You should get this uh, this case study. Okay. Sorry, I'm kind of rushing here. That's that. Questions? Do I have time for questions? Sure. Oh. Um, let, me, let me do this. Anybody, anybody have, if anybody has any questions, feel free to come up and, and see me. A um, couple things I want to say before I left. Number one, thank you very much to the organizers of um, Agile Cymru for the invitation to be here. I hope, I hope you guys um, enjoyed that. I was, I was really glad to be here. Thanks to all the sponsors. Um, the sponsors are really what makes, makes these conference, conferences work, so please go thank a sponsor. Um, thanks to the, you know, all the, the artistry that we have going on in the rooms. I mean, can you imagine the talent that it takes? to try and listen to a presentation, to try and digest it, and then to turn it into, in, into this. So um, I, you know, I, I, I think that's wonderful. A couple of other shameless plugs you guys probably heard. There's a Lean Agile Bright, Brighton coming up. 
um, in October, end of October. And if anybody fancies a trip to Florida, there is uh, Lean Agile US, and it's in February, outside of hurricane season. <laughs> hurricane season finishes December 1st, so at the end of February, uh, February 26th and 27th, um, if you like what you saw here, you'll, you'll love um, what, you, what, what you'll see uh, in the U.S. as well. So anyway, that's all my contact information. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for staying awake. Thanks for